over the years about is how you basically turn into a quivering mass of jello when you're under stress. And that just didn't match with my personal experience in law enforcement, what other people have been able to do. And I became really curious about where this all this stuff comes from. And I started doing my research, and this was my plan. I wanted to look at the myths, the realities, and also figure out how we train in light of this stuff, right? Well, the good news is that I found a buttload of material. The problem is we're not gonna get through all of it today. This is gonna end up being a four hour presentation eventually. Uh, next year will hopefully be completely done. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you all the background to get you guys thinking, and we'll at least get you through the first two hours and deal with at least two of the most popular myths. Uh, so that's why we're not gonna quite get this, but we're gonna be working our way there. Uh, I always appreciate it when people help me out directly. <coughs> And Mox, I thought I had you on here, but I don't. The people over here are people I've bothered, called, emailed, and stuff like this. And if somebody in this day and age gets back to you and stuff like that, gives you material, gives you uh, information, it's always really, really helpful. I like to acknowledge those people. Uh, there's a great saying in the research world that if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. But if you steal from a lot of people, it's research. Uh, there's a bunch of primary sources out there that I think really heavily influence me. Um, and those are you know, probably some of the big ones up there. Um, it's not as commonly available as it once was, but Dr. Paul Weitzel's lecture he did at Let's See a number of years ago, it's just absolutely awesome. It's like a three hour presentation in an hour and a half. Uh, Lawrence Gonzalez did a great book called Deep Survival. Ken Murray's Training at the Speed of Life. Uh, Tom Mavini runs this, uh, I mean, the Police Policy Studies Center. And he's a really good resource for good, solid, up-to-date research, as is the, the four science research guys. Uh, first, of course, uh, mandatory disclosure here. I'm on my own time, in my own dime, taking vacation pay to be here. Therefore, nothing official, you know, represents the uh, official views of my employer, the federal government. I'm not an expert in these matters in any way, shape, or form. And as I said earlier, this is kind of an incomplete project with the research very much ongoing as you talk. Uh, educational background, master's degree in uh, criminal justice, concentration in research methods. My original plan was to go on into a PhD program. Uh, I've been working part-time with the Park Service. I made the interesting life choice to go out and work in Las Vegas for four years. And uh, I had so much fun out there, I just decided to do this full-time, figuring I'd get a PhD later. For those of you that care about certain things, I am a uh, published author in a peer-reviewed journal, so I'm not a complete idiot. Um, although Hathaway might disagree. Um, <laughs> anything I'll tell you about me is on the DISC profile. I'm a very high C. People who are Cs love information for the uh, sake of information, right? I, I, I literally spend my Saturdays at the library over at the local university reading articles and stuff like that. But we also tend to be organized, so hopefully this will make a little, I put this together in a way that makes sense. As I said earlier, I've been a law enforcement officer with the National Park Service. I started with them back in 1992. Uh, I currently teach for my agency uh, firearms, use of force, and our basic tactics program. I've also been teaching here with Tom since 2001, which has gotten to be, in hindsight, a really, really long time now. Um, I've also invented a couple of targets. MGM uh, sells two that I invented. And uh, when I realized I wasn't getting anything for those great ideas, I opened up my own target company. And uh, I do DVC targets and 3G reactives. Uh, are mine. I manufacture, make, and sell those. So if you need any targets, dvctargets.com. And I'm also a pretty serious student. I've pretty much been to almost all the big schools with all the, uh, the traveling guys as far as all that goes. Uh, this is one of the big questions that we need to figure out though, is who wins and who loses? Uh, we struggle to understand, at least intellectually, who wins and loses within the realm of personal combat. We see some absolutely horrible losses in this world. Uh, American law enforcement, there's no good, really solid number, but a widely accepted number is that for every round the police fire, only about 15% of them hit their intended target. There are some exceptions to that. There are some departments that do very well, but a general overall accepted average is about 15%. The FBI also found, interestingly enough, that 85% of the police officers felonously murdered in the line of duty never fired their gun. Does that just sound to anybody else? I mean, it's just amazing to me that you can lose that bad. The gun, you know, never even gets in a discharge and you're felonously murdered. Uh, interesting example, I think most of us now have seen the uh, video showing the uh, murder of the Georgia deputy Kyle Dean Keller. He makes a traffic stop on a disturbed Vietnam veteran. And the, the bad guy ends up loading an M1 carbine. A gunfight ensues. Kyle fires, I believe, 32 rounds. For the 32 rounds he fires, he only gets one hit. It's a grazing kind of a fat roll hit that has absolutely no influence on the fight. And he ends up dead on the side of the Georgia road. Uh, if you watch some of the presentations that have been done for law enforcement training, one of the things I found interesting is that when I interviewed his co-worker, guess who he was? He was the best shot 
in his department. So how is this, this huge void? Here's this guy that had his co-workers had to pick who was going to win the gunfight that day. They would have picked Kyle. But if you've seen the video, you know it doesn't quite work out that way. We also see this a lot of people just barely surviving. You know, they uh, dude pulls a gun, they pull a gun, they each dump a magazine, they run away, and at the end they survive the encounter. But they pretty much just did that because they sucked less than their opponents. They didn't do anything that really gave them a dominant win. They just simply sucked slightly less. We also see some amazing dominating wins by them. Uh, I always am amazed. Jim Cirillo's, you know, everybody that should know Jim Cirillo of Stakeout Squad fame. Well, his most famous gunfight was his first gunfight. This isn't after he had <coughs> gunfights under his belt. This is his first one. He engages three bad guys at a distance running between 20 and 25 yards. Okay, he engages three bad guys. By the way, there's a clerk. Uh, the grocery store clerk is in the middle of his gunfight, so he has a no-shoot. All three bad guys are moving. They're not full-value targets. They're partial targets. And in a period of four seconds, Cirillo kills one and runs the other two off, wounding them both. First gunfight performance, four seconds, shooting 20 to 25 yards, moving target, partial targets, and he just does this dominating, absolutely amazing win. We also have this crew of guys out of LAPD that were trained heavily at Gunsight, Mudgett, Scotty Reitz, uh, Helms, uh, really, really racked up some good numbers on the, uh, the streets out there. Does anybody know how many gunfights Helms has been in? Well, he pleads the fifth on that. Apparently he's had a lot of uh, intense scrutiny on part of the United, perhaps the United States Department of Justice and he simply refuses to discuss how many fights that he's been in, but it's a pretty good number. Okay? We also see some surprising wins, what I see out there. Uh, there's a gentleman that Jeff Cooper wrote about, I'm simply going to call him Eduardo C because he's still alive, um, but he basically at the time of his fight, he's living down in Central in El Salvador, his family is involved in the boating transport business and he's also into guns. 80s down in El Salvador is not the most politically stable time. He apparently upset some people to the point that eight armed men show up at his house one day. Okay, one of these, one of the eight is armed with an AK. Um, fortunately, he is a student of Jeff Cooper, and he has a 1911 with him, and you know the, the seven plus one. Well, at the end of their interchange, right, four bad guys are laying dead on the ground. One is hauled off on a stretcher. The other three run away, and he ends up getting a uh, a wound from the AK in the shoulder but he survives and recovers fully. If I gave you that odds, is it any kind of a scenario, yeah, you've got eight guys, one of them's got an AK, does anybody think that's gonna turn out well for us? No, we don't, but he pulled it off. You've got people like Lance Thomas, the, the watch uh, maker repairman out in California that was in multiple shootings with multiple bad guys and was able to completely dominate those wins. You also see this stuff out here where you know, Range Master now has had 58 successful gunfights from their student body. Uh, basically, just normal, uh, for the most part, private citizen people uh, with just a carry permit level training. Well, how the hell does this happen? This is the answer right here. The winner's skill level and degree of emotional control were sufficient to solve the problem they faced that day. Okay? Maybe if you put them under different circumstances, it would have turned out differently. But on that day, their level of skill and emotional control matched the problem that they had to solve. We're done if anybody wants to leave now. That's like the executive summary right there. Okay. But it seems very reasonable to assume that if we can develop that same level of emotional control, same level of skill, and we face similar problems, what's reasonable? That we should probably expect reasonable results. Of course, we are talking about gunfighting, so there's always this element of luck out there. And there's always the magic BB, right? But what did Arnold Arn Palmer say about it? The harder I practice, the luckier I get. So our purpose here today is to primarily understand winning and losing, to understand how the human animal is wired, how this wiring works for and against us, and whether rewiring the human animal is possible and or desirable. Uh, I also want to counter a vast volume of often self-serving misinformation that exists in this area of performance under stress, and maybe perhaps understand why it exists. Also to understand what level of performance is reasonably possible, and to provide you guys with the best information about improving our personal performance while under stress. 